great. And His greatness is That's all good, but that's not what the verse says. Unsearchable. Okay, <laughs> Can't that, that's a good idea. Every time I quote one of those verses, Ted answers it with a verse other than the one I'm looking for, and he's never been right. <laughs> Yeah, but you pray for him. He's having kidney stone problems, and it's been very difficult for him. Now, we've been looking at Ezekiel 38 and 39, and last week we were discussing uh, the invasion of the northern confederacy, uh, uh, confederacy upon the land of Israel, and uh, we barely got in what we wanted to regarding that. I didn't get in something that I mentioned at the outset of the class, and that is that I implicated the United States in that invasion. I, ne I never did get back to that. And so I must do so this morning. But now let me catch you up. I don't want to teach the lesson all over again, but allow me to catch you up somewhat. It is my conviction that we are on the threshold of this battle and this invasion. I'm not alone in that, but I'm convinced that that is true. I believe that the battle will be the setup for the rise to power of Babylon, which we know today as Iraq. Uh, there are nations that are not mentioned in this text, which are haters of Israel, and we may wonder why they're not there. Egypt, for example, is not mentioned, but Egypt has a peace treaty with Israel. Doesn't change their attitude, but they have a peace treaty with Israel. Jordan has a peace treaty with Israel. They are not mentioned. Jordan is the old Ammonite Moabite Empire. Um, well, I bunny path there with the UN's decree in 47, but we won't go there now. Uh, Iraq is not mentioned. That is, Babylon is not mentioned. And you would think with the attitude of Babylon historically toward the nation of Israel, including today, that they most certainly would be involved in this battle. But right now, Iraq is in a position that it couldn't mount its army against anybody. And I believe that's one of the reasons that they're not there. And I think the scenario for this battle is developing right now. Now, having said that, I know full well how terribly wrong I could be. But I'm willing to accept that chance. And you'll all be aware of it if I'm wrong. And we'll also be aware of it if I'm right. And I don't know if we're looking at it at the end of this election because I know the Islamic world would like very much for Obama to be elected. And that ought to be enough reason for somebody not to vote for him and why somebody is so blind and so deaf that they can't see that is beyond me. But then, of course, that's the state of the world, isn't it? They are deaf and dumb and blind. Dumb with the acceptable sense of they can't even speak. If they do speak, it isn't worth listening to. So much for politicians. Well, not all of them, thank the Lord. In any case, when this invasion does take place, whether it's months, years, even decades, when it ultimately does take place, it will be the setup for the rise of the man of sin. Why? Because these nations that invade Israel are going to be utterly destroyed and decimated. They are not going to be a factor in world politics whatsoever. So great will be their devastation. And we talked about some of what God was going to do uh, to these nations uh, if you want to look at it again, I said I wasn't going to teach it again, but please allow me. Verse 18 of 38, it will come to pass at that same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. And I, I tried to emphasize this last week. 
get a picture of it. The fury coming up. and I just see God getting red in the face with anger. Verse 19. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. And we're going to feel it here. So great will it be, we will feel it here. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places will fall, every wall will fall to the ground. Quite an earthquake. And I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. And here is a kind of historically frequent occurrence with the enemies of Israel. When they come against Israel, every man's sword will be against his brother. They start fighting with one another. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence, disease. And bloodshed, and I will rain down on him his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding, rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And you remember the words of the Lord to Job, have you looked into the treasures of the rain or into the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved to the day of battle and war? What an interesting verse. Hailstones, again, you remember God's way of execution. He did it when they came out of Egypt. Uh, it was the standard method of execution, uh, stoning with the Israelites. And that's what he's going to do with all these nations. And these nations are going to be utterly decimated and their uh, economic ability decimated. And it's going to give opportunity for Iraq they're the ones left not hit that to come to power. And out of that will come the Babylonian kingdom that we know belongs to, to the Antichrist. I think I heard it. Y'all are afraid of me. I can tell that I shouldn't have told that story about Ted. <laughs> now, now, there is a verse here in 38 which I wanted to point to last week and I never could get to. And it is verse 10. And I said at the outset of the lesson last week that the United States is most certainly at risk in this whole battle. Now what I am about to tell you, I must confess ahead of time, is purely lamology. I believe it to be true. But I cannot give you chapter and verse to prove it because the United States does not appear directly in the Word of God. The only nations that are named in the Word of God are those that touch Israel in some direct way. Perhaps China is the one exception to that when God addresses in the kingdom period the land of Sinem, which is China. You remember Sino-Soviet? You recall those phrases we used to hear frequently? Well, you young people never heard it, but it used to be said. That was the Chinese, the Russian relationship. <coughs> and so they have a place there, and that's interesting and could be talked about. But verse 10, I think, is a transition. Now, four times in chapter 38, you see the expression, Thus saith the Lord God. And it's always a transition from what he had been talking about with something else. And I believe verse 10 to change the direction of the prophecy of the Lord to Ezekiel and he's talking about somebody else because the first nine verses direct themselves against the judgment of God uh, upon these nations that come against Israel. And I acknowledge that he will pick it up again from verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, Thus saith the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? And so I acknowledge that the terminology is much the same. Do I, feel like, uh, do I sound like I'm talking in circles? I have to say that. 
But I believe verse 10 and 11 and 12 to take us in a different direction. So verse 10 and following. Thus saith the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you'll make an evil plan. Now isn't it strange that that statement would be way down here in verse 10 when he's already talked about the invasion, God putting hooks in their draw, uh, Russia's jaws and making him uh, a guard for the people and bringing this whole multitude down and uh, they're covering the land, verse 9, like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. And at the same time, you're going to think an evil plan. Sounds to me like that in the midst of all of this seeming success, because he's going to feel like he's successful in coming with this incredible multitude of people. I can't emphasize that too much. They will be a cloud to cover the land. They're going to come like a tsunami upon the nation of Israel. They will come from the south, Libya, and the Sudan, and their horde. They will come from uh, uh, the northern, uh, I call them stands. All those seven stands that are up there in league with uh, Russia uh, from Iran, and all of these nations are going to come down against Israel. And boy, for the first time, the Arab world is going to think, we got them. They can't escape this. There's no help for them in God. You remember the psalmist said that's what the enemies of the Lord would constantly say. There is no help for them in God. That's not a good thing to say when you're attacking Israel because it can cause you problems. It is my conviction that when he says a thought will arise in your mind and you'll make an evil plan, and verse 11, you will say, I will go against the land of unwalled villages. There is only one nation in the world that does not have walled villages. Only one. And we're it. Every other nation, now they don't now, I recognize the modern construction, but every other nation in the world has uh, for their own protection against the cities next to them, walled villages, but not us. And it is my conviction that he's going to decide, now's my chance. And the question has often been raised, why uh, isn't there something said about the United States joining uh, with Israel in her defense? I want to suggest to you, we will not be able to. Now just look at the situation right now. I'm no pundit in this area whatsoever, but i got to say this, and really it grieves me. Having served in the military... Uh, having seen uh, the uh, uh, historical integrity of the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and so forth, we are now enlisting felons. They never could join the Army before. But now we're enlisting felons. Why? Because we are shorthanded. I want to tell you something. I don't want... Uh, to have to thank a felon for rescuing me from the enemy. Now, maybe that's just me. Uh, good men die for their country. Good men. And I'm not interested in sending a bunch of bad guys out there to defend me. I want honorable men to defend me. I don't mind the felons getting killed. That's perfectly all right with me, but <laughs> let them do it to one another. I said, oh, let's say this. The Army is shorthanded. I think if the United States were invaded right now, that it is guys like us that would be defending it. The 3030s and the 22s and 
and the 30 odd sixes would come out of the closet and we would be the ones defending it because we don't have enough army. They are spread thin in Iraq. They are spread thin in Afghanistan. We have troops, of course, in Germany and in England and various other places, but they are all tied up and a long way away. And it is my conviction that Gog, the czar of Russia, uh, by the way, you notice in the news this week that Putin put his successor in. <laughs> so much for elections. He put his successor in and he's groomed him to be what he is. But now he is one of his, uh, I'm going to say protege, it's not the right word. Uh, Putin is one of his advisors, yes, now. So he hadn't left the scene. But the czar of Russia, because there's been this eternal animosity between Russia and the United States is going to see his opportunity and think that he can invade this land. Look at verse 12. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to go to the land of unwalled villages having neither bars nor gates to take a plunder, to take a booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited. That would be us. And against the people gathered out of the nations, that would be us, who have acquired livestock and goods and who dwell in the midst of the land. Now here's an interesting verse, 13. Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia. Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarsus and all their young lions will say, have you come to take a plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock goods, to take away plunder? They're complaining. Why would they complain? Because we're their lifeblood. Yeah. We're the ones that sustain them. As far as I'm concerned, we could cut them off and let them drink that oil for all I care. But they're going to complain because they don't want to see their lifeline cut off. They don't care for us much either, I want you to understand. Because on a daily basis, in the uh, mosques of uh, Egypt, in the mosques of um, Iran, and uh, what's that country I'm talking about? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Prayers are made for the destruction of Israel and the United States. Lamology, maybe, but just consider it. Now, one other thing about that, before I go on to something else, and you're really going to get two lessons today, <laughs> uh, that strikes me is there's no end to the matter. Uh, the text, the context does not go on to say what will happen unless you want to restrict it to Israel and you could do that. I don't think so. Because I, I believe that the United States will survive the situation only because God is going to rain hell down on all those armies and they're not going to be able to fulfill their intention. There won't be anything left of them. If you move over to verse 21. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. Verse 23. And I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. One of the characteristics I noted last week about this whole invasion and about God's destruction upon these nations is that he never personally appears. It is all by natural disaster that he destroys these nations, and he will do it in such a fashion as he did in Egypt so that it will be evident that it is a divine visitation upon them. They're going to know that. 
It's the only way they'll be able to explain their utter destruction. Okay, having said that, I want to take you to chapter 39. Now, 39 has always been a bit of a puzzle to me. Because it seems to start the prophecy again. All over again. And again you have another, thus saith the Lord. Same description. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, which is Russia. Uh, that word, by the way, if you're looking at your King James, it's chief. I remind you once again uh, that the Hebrew word is Rosh, and it is translated chief or first. But it is believed by scholars in general because Israel today refers to Russia as Rosh to be a reference to the nation of Russia, Meshach to the city of Moscow, and Tubal to the city of Tobolsk, and those areas that compass them, because remembering once again that nations, geographical locality, are defined by where the sons of Noah settled. Did I get that out clearly? And so this whole area of Gog is defined by where Gog, the son of Noah, descendant of Noah, settled. In verse 2, And I will turn you around and lead you on. Your King James reads, Leave a sixth part of you. I have to comment on this. It's a curious phrase. So many translations render that phrase, I will turn you around and leave a sixth part of you. Many others, translated as does the New King James, lead you on. I've looked it up in a couple of the lexicons, and it's interesting to me that the Hebrew word is a sixth part. And not being a Hebrew scholar, I'm not going to argue with any of you, any of them, but I do think that God out of this group, as opposed to 38, is going to leave a remnant. And I'll tell you why I say this group momentarily. I will turn you around. I'll leave a sixth part of you. I'll bring you from the far north, same place, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrow to fall out of your right hand. Now we got a different narrative. And you'll fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you, and I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Now, it isn't unusual at all for the Lord to feed his enemies to the fowls of the air. But again, it is of interest to me that those are terms that are used in the book of the Revelation. Now I want you to come back with me to Revelation in chapter 20. I'll get there momentarily. I must read verse 1 in order to establish some context for the future. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven and having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And I'll remind you now that chapter 19 records the second coming of Jesus Christ in power and great glory to take his kingdom over this world. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent who is called the devil and Satan, that's all four of his names. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years are finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So he's going to be chained for a thousand years. Now, I've got a parenthetical bunny path here. 
There are some theological positions in this present day that tell us who are amillennial in their position, that is, there is no millennium, Jesus will never come back to the earth uh, to reign and so forth. That's the amillennial position, no millennium. The alpha negative prefix, no millennium. Who say to us that Satan is currently bound and the thousand years is just a long time period uh, figurative figurative speech and we are in it now well i want to tell you something saints if satan is chained now it is a long chain (laughs) peter said the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour that doesn't sound like he's chained but he's going to be chained when the lord jesus christ returns personally visibly physically to this earth A lot of people deny that too. And he takes the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. He will reign in righteousness and in justice for a thousand years. Now come with me to verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from prison. Now here's your verse. And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. And now we don't know how long it's going to take him to do that. It might be a month. It might be two years that God gives him to go out and deceive the nations. The only reason that certain goat nations, that opens another issue, but I can't address it now. There are sheep nations and goat nations. The sheep nations are uh, ruling with the Lord. The goat nations are in servitude to the sheep nations. Uh, You have that in the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25, but we can't go there now as I just did. (laughs) And we don't know how long it's going to take him to deceive these goat nations and goats in sheep nations to rebel against the one who's sitting on the throne because up to this time, Nobody had nerve enough to dare rebel against the king on the throne. They had to be deceived into thinking that they could. And that's Satan's great work. He is the deceiver. Yes. And so he goes out to the four corners of the earth to deceive the nations, uh, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, whose number uh, is as the sand of the sea. Gog and Magog? You know, as the Jews would say, that was always a bone in my throat. Gog and Magog. Um, Why does it appear here in Revelation 20? How come we didn't have uh, an end to it back in uh, chapter 38 or 39? Well, I'm going to suggest something to you. That chapter 39 is not connected to chapter 38. There are at least 1,007 years between chapter 38 and chapter 39. That's why it begins as it does. Because my bone in the throat is removed when I recognize that chapter 39 is looking to an invasion after the release of Satan in the last days. And fire is going to come down out of heaven and devour them. Let's have a look at a couple of verses. We've already made mention of the birds of prey. Revelation chapter 19 addresses the visitation of the birds of prey to devour those that are destroyed in the battle of Armageddon. They are God's garbage collectors. And they're very efficient. That's why when we come to later verses in chapter 39, they're the Israelites are burying bones because they've been picked clean by the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air. In verse 6, 
God says, 39.6, God says, I will send a fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. You don't have a suggestion of that in chapter 38, but you do have it pointed to in chapter 20 of Revelation. When God is going to send a fire down on them. Now, you say, well, that's a pretty short statement. Well, it is a short statement. It's not elaborated on. I remember I was in a, uh, back in the days when I was a Baptist. You forgive this, all you former Baptists. Or current Baptists. Or going to be Baptists. <laughs> you never know who will be here, you know. I do appreciate the faithfulness of the saints. But I was in a conference one time, and, and there was a debate going on with a very high-profile Baptist preacher, good man, and uh, an Englishman. The Baptist preacher was amillennial, and the Englishman was premillennial. And the uh, Englishman was... Uh, of course, arguing the point of the literal interpretation of Revelation, many Old Testament passages, uh, Paul's words in Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, and so you could go with it. And uh, uh, this uh, Baptist preacher, he cited Peter's second epistle, and uh, he cited the fact that Peter simply said, uh, there, that God was going to send a fire on the earth is going to be burned up. And this Englishman said, well, Peter didn't write a very long epistle, did he? <laughs> I cracked up. You cannot take singular verses to interpret vast amounts of Scripture. No Scripture is, Peter said, self-solving. Of any private interpretation, literally that means self-solving. You have to compare line on line, precept on precept, here a little and there a little, before you get the truth. Well, I said all that to say this. Uh, Jesus didn't give us a whole lot of description about all that's going to take place when he sends that fire on Magog. He just tells us he's going to send a fire on Magog and he's going to burn them all up in Revelation 20. I would suggest to you he's looking at the same circumstance here that we have in verse 6. I will send a fire on Magog and on those who dwell or live securely in the coastlands. All those people that stayed home. They all hate us. I trust you know that, don't you? I mean, uh, you've got the, the uh, declaration of Iran right now that they hate America and they hate uh, 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 Israel. Um, i got to mention this. I was watching Fox News, and this was probably a year and a half ago now. I don't know. And Roger Mudd, you remember him? Very, uh, a man of great integrity. He was interviewing Franklin Graham. And they were talking about the Middle East, and Franklin Graham said, I've traveled extensively in the Middle East for several years. And he said, I want to tell you that they hate us. They hate us because we are Christians and Jews. And they hate us because we are free. And I got a kick out of this. Roger Mudd looked at the camera and he said, I can't believe he said that. <laughs> I really cracked up then. But that's true. They hate us. And all of our efforts to make a, di a distinction between moderate Islam and uh, uh, terroristic, aggressive Islam is foolishness. The only reason we have moderate Muslims is because they're not in political control. And if Muslims took control of this country, every Muslim in this country would be a radical. They would have to be at pain of their own death. So make no mistake about it, bless your sweetheart. Uh, we are well at risk. I'll get back to that. Some of the differences I wanted to point out. Uh, 
39.3, uh, we don't have this in 38. God says, I'll leave a sixth part of you. Uh, and again, some of them render that, I'll lead you on, but I'll leave that to you to uh, fuss over. Uh, the reference to the fowls of the air coming to the sacrificial meal, I think is particularly important. You don't see that in 38. And again, Revelation 20 and verse 9, fire comes down out of heaven and devours them. Now, uh, thoughts about the time element. Weapons of war. Uh, let's start with verse uh, 7, if we may. I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. And then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields, the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the javelins, the spears, and they shall make fires with them for seven years. Now, that's another bone in my throat. And I would read that passage and I think to myself, boy, this battle is taking place in the last days. That's been made very evident by several verses. And so we, are we burning bows and arrows and spears and, and uh, shields and so forth? And my only conclusion to that would be, well, they're metaphorical. But they're not. Now I want to take you to Micah and his prophecy. And chapter 1, please, or chapter 4, I'm sorry, in verse 1 of Micah chapter 4. Now, this is the context of the kingdom reign of the Lord Jesus. I don't have time to elaborate on that and give you evidence of it. You can read it on your own. Remember, you do have a responsibility when I get finished. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, because they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They didn't trust Paul. There's no reason for you to trust me. So you can seek this context yourself. From verse 1 of Micah 4. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, that's because he's there, and he shall judge between many peoples, sheep nations, goat nations, and rebuke strong nations afar off. Now watch this. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. What's going to be one of the characteristics of the kingdom reign of Jesus Christ? Weapons of war will be done away. And it's going to become an agricultural uh, uh, environment for the world during that whole thousand years. So when we come to the end of the thousand years, and Satan goes out to deceive the nations once more, well, they we're going to fight with. Come with me to Joel. And chapter 3. I mean, they're not going to go to the backside of Russia and start building tanks. Joel chapter 3, are you uh, with me? Verse 7. Again, there's a lot of context here, and I should like to address it all. Uh, look at verse 2. I ought to do that. I will get, also gather all nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people and my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, 
and they have also divided up my land. I believe that to be a prophecy of uh, 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 1947. They divided his land. He took a dim view of that. All right, verse 7. Behold, I will raise them up out of the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your retaliation upon your own head. I'm going to do to you what you did to them. You can look at Isaiah 14 and start with verse 2, and you can see that. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a people afar off. For the Lord has spoken that proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up and beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into shears. Let the weak say, I am spears, I'm sorry. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come all you nations and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be awakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Verse 13, put in the sickle. For the harvest is ripe, come down to the wine press, for it is full and the vats overflow. Now why would they beat their uh, plowshares into swords, except that that's what they had to fight with? And I would suggest to you, when Satan is loosed for that season, that he is going to uh, so deceive these people into thinking that they can Bring down the Lord Jesus from his throne. And he is the great deceiver. That they're going to turn these implements of farming into implements of war. And they're going to come against the city of Jerusalem and the mountain of the Lord. And God will utterly destroy them there. Now, I realize that you can argue with my premise, and you're certainly welcome to do so, and it's going to be uh, a thousand years at least before we find out if I'm right. <laughs> and by that time, you'll have forgotten I ever existed. Paul tells us we see through a glass darkly. Jesus said, when these things come to pass, you'll know. In the final analysis, no prophecy is ever really realized in its fullness until it happens. But either way, believers are going to see the end of the matter. Now I want to make some comments, if I may as a kind of appendage here, allow me, to what I believe to be the threat that is upon the United States. I've already mentioned that we make a distinction between extreme Islam and moderate Islam, and I think we are dead wrong in doing that. Our politically correct stance has made us deaf to the very real catastrophe that's before us. Before we ever get out of this meeting, uh, they could start setting off nuclear bombs, whether dirty bombs or something worse than that. And we don't seem to realize or even believe that the threats are real or that they'll carry them out. We really don't. We don't believe that what they're threatening, they'll really carry out. But I want to tell you, they will. And we still have this stupid notion that can't happen here. But it will. Somebody says, well, how could they invade the nation of Israel? We have a navy and we have an air. They don't have to invade. They're already here by the thousands. They're in England by the thousands. They're in Spain by the thousands. They don't have to invade. There are mosques in this country right now where the imam is preaching the destruction of the United States. I see that as treason. I don't know why nobody else seems to, but I see it as treason. 
And if the guy's not a citizen of the United States, he needs to be deported to one of these nations that's going to get burned up. I'm going to, I want to draw very quickly, I know time's running out, but I want to draw very quickly on a not too distant historical experience. When the United States uh, went to war in Korea, when North Korea invaded South Korea, we went to war with them, we were pledged to support them, and to make a long story short, MacArthur made that invasion at Incheon and he cut those guys off and we had won the war. Except, MacArthur didn't believe the Chinese would come in, but they did. And what they did was not, you know, you can see um, a uh, train of uh, trucks coming down roads to bring troops, to uh, reinforce an army, etc., etc. So you can see helicopters bringing troops to reinforce an army. They didn't do that. They walked thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Chinese volunteers. Yes, of course, who believes that? Walked across the mountains of North Korea until they utterly surrounded our troops and we didn't even know they were there. And when night fell, they went into our camps and bayoneted our men in their sleeping bags. They went into their tents and they bayoneted men in their bunks until we experienced a holocaust of murder across our troops. And it drove us all the way back to what was called the Pusan perimeter until we got our uh, handle on the situation again. And thousands died. I would suggest to you that we can be equally blind to what is surrounding us right now. I'm not suggesting you go out and kill Muslims. I hope you understand that. They may come to you. <laughs> Islam is all around us. It's all around France. It's all around Spain. It's all around England. We are surrounded. The voices in this country that are saying we must address their grievances. Their grievance is that we're a free people and we live in a republic. And that we are Christians and Jews. That's their grievance. How are you going to fix that? You can't fix that. They're not interested in negotiating. They don't want to negotiate. Jimmy Carter, notwithstanding... We could suddenly find ourselves run over by terrorists who would rather die than live. Because if they die in battle and they go to heaven and they get these, I heard first seven virgins, but then I heard 21 virgins, I don't know. Going to be crowded up there with virgins. When these guys get there, they won't be. I think that uh, the, the insanity that they believe is a mark of the deception of Satan upon the Islamic world. And we could suddenly find ourselves surrounded with terrorists who would rather die than live. Kamikazes all over again. I just ask you to consider it. I might be wrong about the time of the invasion of chapter 38. I might be wrong about our being involved in that invasion, howbeit I do not think it's successful. Uh, not because I think we're so good. I think that uh, they're not going to be able to finish because they're going to get wiped out. I would hope in that day we would be found to be a sheep nation, but that remains to be seen. And I may be dead wrong about chapter 39 relating to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9 as a second prophecy altogether. If many of these prophecies in the Old Testament were written thousands of years before their fulfillment, why couldn't we have one that's written a thousand years after we, we arrived? 
Just as easy. I just ask you to consider it. Let's stand and pray. Father, we acknowledge that we are ignorant of so many things and that our interpretation of your scripture is here in part and there in part. We acknowledge we see through a glass darkly. We acknowledge we don't know the end of the matter. And so we're relying upon you. We can only receive what we read and believe it. And that's what we've done. We put it in your hands to your purpose and end. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you for your patience.